Well, we're on a dual mission today. I say mission because it's a top secret military mission. Mm -hmm. We're not allowed to tell you where we're going on this bus nope. or who we're going to go see. No. But he does have his own huge collection of military vehicles, including over a dozen tanks. Right. And that's pretty fascinating, but he asked me not to tell anybody who he is or where he is. We're traveling with the Plastic Model Club, the IPMS, and we're going out to his huge collection at a top, top secret, top secret site. Area. And then we're going off to the NMRA meeting. Right. They're meeting in their new meeting space in downtown Salt Lake City. Right. And they've started a railroad there, and we're going to look at what they built. Uh, yeah, more space. Because they started on it today, so we're not That's expecting right. to see a whole not lot of progress. Lot. Yeah, no. but you never but know. But it should be a fascinating day out. <laughs> this has certainly got to be one of, if not the premier, private collection of military vehicles. If these were scale models, it would still be an incredibly impressive collection, but they're not. They're fully operational, completely restored military vehicles. The collection is not open to the public, but the local chapter of the IPMS, the International Plastic Modeler Society, has been invited in today to tour the collection. And how cool is that? All of these things run. They are used occasionally in motion pictures, but they are principally just a private collection, you know, for screwing around with. I wish I could tell you more about these things, but I'm not an expert on armor, not even vaguely close. But I know a lot of you IPMS guys certainly are, so why don't you join in in the comment section and tell us something about these vehicles. The owner of the collection here would really rather not me say who he is or where he is. He's already contacted a dozen times a day by people who want to see the collection, and he wants to play with the collection, not give tours all day long. So for purposes of the video, let's just refer to him as Mr. Smith. Now this is perhaps one of the very, very good reasons for joining a club like the IPMS. A group can quite often get into places where an individual would have no access. Not that there aren't other perfectly valid reasons for joining a club like the IPMS. Here's an unusual tank. Mr. Smith told me it's the only one in a private collection. The others are all in museums. When he found it, it was being used as a bulldozer. It had no turret on it, and he went looking for a turret, found one in France, and yeah, it took a lot of finagling, but he got it here and restored his tank. A lot of these tanks are valued at well over a million dollars, between one and one and a half million dollars. And there's about 20 of them in the collection, so feel free to do the math. They are principally World War II vintage and principally American tanks, although there are a few outliers here, a few pieces of German armor, and even one Japanese tank.
Now this little thing is not a tank. It's a German bomb, a remote controlled bomb. It would be guided across the battlefield out to an American tank and then detonated. Now this thing here is a Sherman tank, but it's a later Sherman tank with increased armor. It's the sort of thing that was used at the Battle of the Bulge later in the war. This is a new acquisition here, and it's undergoing restoration. Mr. Smith has an entire team of people to keep his tanks and other vehicles running and restore them. This is one of the engines for the tank. It's a Ford engine, but it's based on a British Merlin airplane engine, an aircraft engine. Ford simply re-engineered it into a V8. The collection also includes a large number of half-track vehicles. These are treaded vehicles at the rear. The front is essentially the same as the front on a truck. They're lightly armored. Now, I've driven one of these things, and I can tell you from first-hand experience that the handling characteristics are, well, let's just say, peculiar. And when it comes time to stop, plan ahead. of other military vehicles here. This one's really weird, isn't it? But the military needs trucks and jeeps and other types of vehicles to support the armor and the artillery and the infantry and so on. And the officers need some way to get around when they're not in battle or even when they are in battle. So there are a lot of staff cars here as well. And uh, then, of course, there's this thing. And no collection would be complete without at least one Jeep. One thing you can say for sure about military vehicles is the form follows function. And boy, does that lead to some unusual forms. And this thing looks like it would just plain be fun to drive around. And there's a lot of other types of equipment here. There's a nice collection of motorcycles, love motorcycles, and the military did use them rather extensively. This German motorcycle had this machine gun on it, and it was quite lethal. Now another use for all of this stuff is in battle reenactments, World War II battle reenactments. And so, for reenacting purposes, there is a large collection of small arms and very, very large arms to be used in battle reenactments. Battle reenacting has really taken off recently as a hobby. It is a, a very interesting way to spend the afternoon screwing around. And Mr. Smith does have a small and very interesting collection of artillery here. Now, Mr. Smith found this interesting artifact rusting away on the island of Okinawa. Wow, if it were mine, I'd leave it just as it is. It's amazing. Well, it seems that for everything that can be collected, there is a collector collecting it. And isn't it amazing when you find somebody that's doing it on this kind of level? Wow, that's screwing around. Well, after returning to Salt Lake, Karen and I went to the monthly meeting of the NMRA, the National Model Railroaders Association, here in the Children's Center at the Gateway. That's their new meeting space. And today they had a hands-on demonstration by artist Gil Bennett on how to paint a backdrop for your model railroad. Gil's an amazing artist and a really fun guy, and we really appreciated his help in teaching us how to paint a backdrop. 
This was very timely for us as the railroad at Garage Mahal is in the backdrop phase. Here we have Steve and Al working on putting up the coving and Karen and I are now going to undertake painting the backdrop on it. It's a rather large backdrop, but that's because we're modeling in 120.3 scale. Oh, that's, <gasps> a, that's an exhausting long day starting at 6 o'clock this morning. Oh, no kidding, but it was a lot of fun. Worth <sighs> it. What a day. What yeah. a bunch to take in in one day. It's a little overwhelming. A little overwhelming. I've learned so much. But it's only possible because of two different clubs that we're members of that, right. that made all of this happen today. Otherwise, we would have been stayed home and watched Howdy Doody on reruns <laughs> or something. So that's cool that there are these clubs. They're fun. If you, if you haven't been to the web page or the channel, the web page is toymantelevision.com and the channel is right here on YouTube. It's just called Toyman Television. Mm -hmm. Now you can navigate over to the channel by clicking on the blue subscribe button, which is coming in down here in just a moment. If you're not a subscriber, that button will also make you a subscriber. Otherwise, it just takes you to the channel where there's 130... Six, oh, five, I don't know, I lose track. There's a lot of movies. Right. And they're all over there, and that button's popping in just now. See the blue button? It says subscribe. So one way or the other, that's a win thing to go to the button. Right. But we're not sure how you found this movie on the internet. We hope you didn't find it boring. No. <laughs> and we will see you here again next week with some more massive screwing around. See you then. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.